Okay, so I call it a battle rhythm. It's what we use in the army. So just having a nice set regular rhythm of things and just you just find that it puts the oil into the cogs of your business and things just tend to work better. Hello and welcome to the Gross Profit Podcast. My name is James Kennedy. I'm the CEO, co-founder at procurementexpress.com. We take the hassle out of managing your company spend with magical features, but we're not going to talk about that today. I've got Michael Harley uh, from Breakthrough CFO, and you should listen to this podcast if you would be curious as to how British Army might run your finances, because that's exactly where Michael built a lot of his experience, and he's found some innovative ways to bring that into practical approaches to helping his clients. Thanks for coming along, Michael. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are in the world to kick things off. Yeah, hi, James. Thanks very much for having me on. So I'm in, um, yeah, Mike Harley. I'm based in West London, sort of Hammersmith, Chiswick Way, just, uh, just a stone's throw from the Thames here. I run Breakthrough uh, CFO Services, done that now for about four years. Just for a bit of fun, I see a lot of books in your background there. Um, if I was to walk into your house and just try and judge you by your books, what would I learn about you? That's a good question. Um, well, they're also, yeah, actually, I think you can figure it out because they're sort of divided up in a certain way. So you've got a, a big kind of business section here. So that would probably be like there's something businessy. There's actually a big army section, military history. I have to say I'm a bit of a military history kind of buff in my spare time. So there's kind of a bit of that. So you might you might put those two and two things together. I don't know about the rest though. There's a bit of philosophy without sounding too um, pseudo intellectual, but that was what I studied at university. So there's a there's a bit of that there, and then there's there's a big fiction section kind of up front. So it's a bit of a mix. You might think I'm a, a bit of a blend, but I think you might pick up the army and the business stuff for sure. So let's kick off. You've got a really interesting strategy I want to get into later, which is the battle rhythm for the businesses you work, which is fascinating to me. But before we get to there, tell us a bit, you know, how about you started off, you, I think you joined the army first. Tell, tell us about that career and what, what happened after that. I came straight out of university. I did a bit, bit of a sort of milk round of interviews, big city jobs, didn't really want to do them. So I joined the army and uh, was seven years of British army, did a couple of tours of Iraq and decided at that point that was probably uh, enough excitement for me. But it was a great experience. I actually absolutely loved it. Learned a lot. You get a huge amount of responsibility very young in the army, um, which you don't really necessarily get always in the civilian world. So it was fantastic. Then I left, I went to business school for a couple of years, London Business School, got an MBA, and a couple of years in consulting. So, you know, big strategy consulting projects for big companies. And then worked for a education technology startup for a couple of years, worked for a, a kind of mercurial Silicon Valley CEO who took to the business from $20 million to $100 million in a couple of years, uh, which was which was great to watch. I can't take any of the credit, um, but it was a great learning experience for me. And then, yeah, since then, really, uh, I, I ran my own gym business for a number of years and have, yeah, four years now being uh, running a fractional CFO business. I've often heard about people making a the transition to Civvy Street, as they call it. And what was that like? Because I guess you were school to the army. It's still quite structured. And suddenly you're booted out into the world. Was it hard to adapt or would you like a duck to water? You're like, no, this is fine. This is always what I wanted to do. A bit of both. It, it certainly is not easy. It, it's a hard transition. I think like anything, you go from being feeling like you know exactly what you're doing and feeling quite top of your game and having quite a lot of actually authority and um, confidence in what you do to kind of having to start again. That's always hard. I think whatever that's it's probably the same, same as changing other jobs. Uh, so that was definitely, definitely quite a transition. I remember my first consulting project being asked to make a big Excel model. I, I barely used it, uh, you know, maybe once or twice ever in the army. And I, I, I had no idea even where to start. Terrifying. Um, but like anything, you learn the tools, you bring things from your previous experience, which you never thought might be relevant that turn out to be relevant. Especially, I mean, moving into that startup, you talked about, I mean, I don't know any of the startup I've worked in, you know, the structure is often totally missing and the direction sometimes is totally missing. It's fascinating to me that in the army, it provides such structure and you know exactly what you're doing. Like you said, you're the best at what you're doing, but creating that feeling within a company is quite hard to do because most companies are not like that. Even if, you know, you're supposed to show up at nine and go home at five, 
all the bits in the middle are missing oftentimes. Being a, a private soldier, a junior soldier, is you have a very structured life. As, a, as, as an officer in the army, you're actually the one that provides that structure and often when there is none. So you might be, you know, sometimes I was, you know, a week into two weeks patrolling in the desert on the Iranian border. There's no itinerary, there's no plan, there's no, there's nothing uh, unless I decide what it is. So I, actually often being a junior officer, which is why there's a, there's a lot of stuff written about how military people often go fit well into startups rather than big bureaucracies. But actually you, you, you're quite used to working in unstructured, uncertain environments and having to just make a plan and go with it without necessarily the confidence that that plan is right. But, you know, 80% feels like the right thing to go and corralling the troops and going, right, this is what we're going to do. That's something I definitely have feel I've brought over. And I think that's actually some, something, perhaps I wasn't a good fit for corporate life because of that, because there was no, there's no space to bring that uh, skill or experience. You, you have to kind of fit rigidly into a, into a nice box. Whereas the startup world, you know, just look at Amazon, you know, huge US Marine Corps uh, contingent who started Amazon. And there's plenty of other examples where, you know, military people have been brought in. They're great. I think I like employing them myself. You know, they're great in unstructured environments, figuring things out, putting things in some kind of order and just going for it without overanalyzing or tripping over themselves too much, which, is, you know, that's a key part of running a small business. Sounds very useful. Sounds very familiar, actually. So you, you had a bit of corporate experience um, and then poor you, you were bitten by the entrepreneurial bug, sounds like, and you started a, a gym. Was there a connection between physical fitness in the army and then moving on to the gym business? Did that lend itself? What inspired you to do that and what did you learn from it? Yeah, I've always been into my sport and my um, fitness uh, yeah, from from pretty young age, big runner. I've run uh, quite a few marathons, ultra marathons, triathlons, Ironman, etc. And uh, I've got quite a lot of relatives living overseas. Got quite a big family on my mother's side, and a few of them live in Australia. And they dragged me to this fitness class that I didn't really want to go to, and I thought it was so good. I thought I need to bring this over to the UK. And it took a couple of years negotiating with the. It was a franchise with a franchisee to let us bring it over, finding a location, all the rest of it, gathering some team, raising some money. Got it all going. Did pretty well straight out of the bat. Was incredibly hard work. Probably the hardest work I've done almost since probably army training. Classic starting small business, all hands to the pump, seven days a week type type activity. But it was hugely fun and rewarding. And so we opened. We opened one. We opened another, and we were on the verge of buying and a chain just before a mystery virus from uh, Asia was uh, drifting over. Allegedly. Yeah, ex sorry, yes, exactly, allegedly, quite right. We told the lawyers to sort of delay that as much as possible and we, yeah, we had, we had to pull out of that deal and um, to be honest, a year into COVID, that business was pretty much dead. We had to kind of exit. Yeah, which was really hard at the time, but at the same time, it was great experience and I don't think I could do what I do now actually without that experience, because to, to experience the highs and lows of a small business owner, that, that the fear of, can I pay payroll? Uh, can I pay my VAT bill? You know, stressing over making sales, customers, trying to organize finance operations, marketing strategy, sales all at one go. I feel like it gives me a, a perspective. I, I know what it's like to be in the shoes of a, of a small business owner, that there's no good time to start a business or you're never ready, but you just learn, you know, I learned more in that first year of doing that than in a year and a half of an MBA and a few years in consulting for sure. Um, great experience. Well, you're either learning or earning. That's what I've, that's my experience. So, so that's quite a lot of compared to a lot of people's experience, that's a lot of operational experience in a broad set, different parts of the business. So what was the transition from the gym business? What led you to start to, I guess your MBA would have given you the finance background and the training there technically to do a lot of the, the work. And then where'd you get the idea to start offering your services to other businesses? And why pick the CFO role? Sounds like you could have been a marketer or a COO or anything. Why? Why CFO? We definitely offer a kind of broad set of services as, as, as breakthrough CFO. So that's certainly the umbrella because I, I think finance is, it's actually often like the real heart of any business. It might not be loved as that, but it, but it is. And it's often, I, in my experience, 
probably the most ignored part of running a small business as well, simply because there's so much else to do. It's the thing that gets, um, that, that, that often gets ignored. When I ran um, gym businesses, I got asked to kind of look after a region's worth of franchises and help them out a bit. I think partly because I probably had a bit of business background and, and whatever, I, I didn't feel particularly qualified to do so, but, but I, I, I said, fine. So we had, we used to have kind of monthly calls and I just used to share some of the tools that I used running the business. These were other business owners and, uh, and a round table type thing, was it? Exactly. So we'd all be on a call. It'd be, you know, somewhere between I don't know, 10 and 20 other franchisees. You know, often these are, these, these are guys, you know, guys running gyms that might be in their kind of mid, mid late twenties. Uh, and you know, they just, just to share some, some simple tools that I used to run it. Sometimes you used to get other people share some of their tools. Um, some of them were finance, some of them more management orientated, but yeah, those kind of tools. And, uh, yeah, I just started getting a few phone calls after those meetings. Oh, would you mind sharing this with me? And it just sort of ad hoc. It was quite, I didn't know it at the time, but it was, it was kind of training me, I think in my future, my, my next step. And then when COVID hit and essentially I had nothing to do, there was very little to do other than console my depressed and very bored staff, which was very tough as well. I just started helping out a few friends, small businesses and startups, partly to just keep my brain occupied. And, uh, again, I found consistently that finance was the weakest area. I have no technical finance background, but I've got an MBA. Um, I studied, I, I sort of economist by background, sort of relatively mathsy. And in consulting a lot of the other projects I've done in my, tw in my thirties, sort of you tend to work with P and L's, you tend to work with finance, you're creating long-term business plans. You're dealing with P and L's and balance sheets and cash flow forecasts. So I knew my way around it. I ran it all for the gyms, um, that, that I own personally, I, I did all that, that kind of finance stuff. So something that comes sort of quite naturally to me. And to be honest, for small businesses, it's not always, it's not always that complicated and you can, you can get tied up in this sort of the accountancy side of it. But it's much more having you know, simple kind of tools and plans going forward. So I think forward-looking finance rather than backward-looking finance. And which, which of those tools would you say were people most interested in? Let's start off with the one we, we'd said we talk about anyway, it is creating what I call a battle rhythm. Uh, it's, I've stolen that from an army phrase. So you, your battle rhythm is your sequence of generally meetings, but meetings or other regular things you need to know to do in your business. It can be a, a set document uh, or just a list uh, anywhere that you then calendarize that makes sure you, you are running on the right kind of frequency. Things get done at the right time. It sounds really obvious uh, and, and, and nothing too special and it's not, but it's amazing actually how often the simple things get missed just because they're not calendarized and we all get caught up in how busy life is um, and, and you know the urgencies and demands of a small business. So let me give you an example, uh, a weekly meeting, a weekly operational, a uh, weekly sort of sales, sales meeting uh, is often key, or at least a weekly meeting. Review the key KPIs in your business, particularly for a consumer type business. Um, absolutely essential, a regular pricing review uh, amazing how many businesses I work with who haven't increased prices for well over a year, uh, even in a 10% inflation environment. Uh, you often need specific operational review, finance reviews, right? So I, as part of what I do, I do a two hour a month, what I call a CFO call, scheduled every month. Uh, it's always within the first seven days of a new month. Everything has to be ready. It then forces the owner to get all the receipts and invoices across to the bookkeeper before then. And suddenly before you know it, you're driving like this nice cycle of operations and things just tend to work. Okay, so I call it a battle rhythm. It's what we use in the army. So just having a nice set regular rhythm of things and just you just find that it puts the oil into the cogs of your business and things just tend to work better. We do an accounts receivable review. I do it every quarter, Rich. Rich kind of does the finances on our team. And we always find something. We always find someone who hasn't been billed something you know we do a bit of a review it's funny you think oh, this is so obvious that couldn't fall through the cracks you know but actually it does <laughs> no matter how good your system you think it is when you actually sit down do a bit of an audit every now and again exactly i think that's it i i can't tell you the number of times i've sat in my own you know my own, oh i've got to do that regular thing that i said i do and you don't really want to do it and you think it might be pointless but then just as you say you go through and you're like 
oh my God, I'm glad I did that. I really would have missed something. I don't think of it a bit like a, a pilot in a plane doing their sort of checks. Yeah, I'm sure these switches are already in the right place, but, but if one of them's not, something's going to go wrong. And it's, it's, just, it's just great discipline to have it. And it's great for your team. I think without going off a tangent here, I think sometimes it's easy as a business owner, and I've, I've gone through this myself, to think that you don't want to give too much structure. You don't want to um, smother your team. I think actually most people love structure. They like the regularity, the how things work nice and smoothly, no panic, no urgent requests, a nice sequence of what happens. It's very calming. It's a nice place to work when you, when you have a kind of system. Well, there's a book, which probably on your bookshelf, if it's not, it should be, it's called The Checklist Manifesto. And it's all about this stuff. And the, the example from that I love is these surgeons who are kind of kings of their domain in hospitals who kind of do things the way they want to do. They've got a team of 10 or 20 people and they started making these surgeons do basic checklists like, you know, hygiene checks and things which were totally obvious. And just by going over those basics, you know, things like length of stay reduced in the hospital, outcomes improved. Some of these improvements were that I might have spent, you know, millions of dollars developing a new medical technique to improve, to get the same sort of improvement that just looking after the basics was yielding just by making even experienced people just go through these checklists. I've got a friend doing that in the NHS right now, and it's fascinating doing it. He's basically doing exactly this, introducing checklists for, for, for surgeons. It was showing the reduction in operations where the wrong limb is uh, amputated since they've been introducing checks. It, not in Britain, it was actually from a different country. So this is an example that he showed. Yeah, it's sort of staggering. So I guess the analogy applies, right? Uh, if, you, yeah, if you have a nice sequence of things you've got to do, you're unlikely to chop a limb off your business, uh, at, at least not the wrong one. I could talk about checklists for another half an hour, but I know there are two other things tools in your bag there you want to talk about? So I had, I had three, these are like practical tools. For most businesses, I think this should be weekly, a weekly scorecard of numbers that you should track. Again, I, I don't have too many original thoughts on this. Everything I've learned is from probably some pretty well-known books. I've seen this really transform businesses and I've certainly got my longest standing clients, I think would agree. Uh, well, they definitely agree. They absolutely love the scorecard. It is the, it's the control panel for the business. It makes us feel like we have all the levers and buttons right in front of us that we can push at any time and all the dials. It's, it's often I find it's things that even bigger businesses actually don't have. They either have a list of a hundred KPIs, which is so overwhelming, you're unable to pick the, um, the, the important points. And you, can't, you can't see the wood for the trees, which can be okay for certain businesses, maybe B2B sales, sometimes that, that can sometimes, but most businesses, a weekly one is key. Having the right metrics, three to seven metrics, is plenty. If you want to have more, have more. I think that's that's really key. And and just why what well, why is it so important? It has multiple multiple roles. Firstly, it acts as like an early warning system. So you have your monthly plan, your quarterly plan. But if you miss a week, that's that's a quarter of your month, uh, pretty much. And you know, and and also it probably means that something's wrong. So it's more likely that the next week's going to go wrong as well, and the next week as well. You can't wait to the end of the month to figure that out. And even if you do manage to get your management reporting done within the first week of the next month, which most businesses don't, you're still five weeks into a quarter before you might identify what's gone wrong. So, so that's really, really key. Secondly, it enables you to see trends. If you keep history, I always make them keep at least 13 weeks of history, but actually most businesses would just, you can scroll back on the Excel or whatever it is. Very simple, by the way, Google Sheets Excel is fine on this. And it enables you to see trends over time. You get to see the um, cyclicality of your business, um, seasonality. You can see where you know, leads peak and sales peak and um, hiring struggles or whatever, whatever sort of big things that you need to watch out for in your business. You start to see it. And, and rather than just conceptually, you can see it in numerical terms. And you begin to much plan more around it much better. So I think that's really key. Well, before we move on, because that's very interesting, and let me add a tricky question here, which is, so we've had KPIs lots of times, and then sometimes we're measuring them, we're putting them in the sheet. In fact, we track ours daily, and we meet on a daily basis, look at the KPIs, everyone has a number, et cetera. 
And then sometimes you feel like you wonder whether, well, sometimes these numbers can be a bit of a vanity metric. How do you decide what makes a good metric that's actually worth tracking other than just being a distraction or just busy work? The easiest way I think is, is to work backwards. So you need to work backwards from your ultimate goal of your business back to your, whatever it is, your three or five year plan. You hopefully have a one year plan. You break that down into a quarterly or perhaps monthly plan. And then when you have that, you'd be like, oh, right, okay. It's pretty clear. This is where we were last month. This is what we need to do next month. We need to get from A to B. And that the, there's more than likely a couple of key things that will jump out. Very often these are sort of funnel related metrics. We need more leads or we need more qualified leads or we need more yeah, meetings that come off these leads or whatever it might be. Very often it's, it's, it's something like that. So those can spring out quite quickly. The other thing is to have a bit of a blend of, you know, I'm sure you're aware, sort of leading and lagging metrics. So vanity metrics are almost always lagging metrics. Like how well did we do last week or month? Oh, look, we gained 28 Instagram followers. Well done us. Fantastic. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm being slightly facetious, but that, that, that actually often is a sort of marketing metric and it's very often not very relevant. So yeah, having metrics that look forward uh, or predict your future performance tends to be of much greater value than ones that just tell you how well you did yesterday, because they are literally whether you just pat yourself on the back or you make yourself go, oh, we didn't do very well. Either way, not very useful because you are where you are. So what do I mean by that? I mean, actually what I was talking about earlier, number of leads arriving is actually quite a good metric of how your sales is going to do in the future. Number of, uh, it can be things like, yeah, phone calls booked in. Sometimes you have a hiring metric, you know, how many interviews have we got lined up in the next? So something that predicts how well you're going to do in the future tends to be by its very nature, less vanity related than anything that, that's just past looking. I guess there's a mirror analogy there, isn't there? We've been working on this a lot. And what we're trying to do is we say, well, we have our, our goal, which is a lagging indicator. So let's say net profit uh, and you break that down and then you're like, okay, well, that means number of leads we want, number of conversion rate on the sale, et cetera. For some people they're leading, some, some people they're lagging, right? So for the sales game, you know, number of leads they have to work on is sort of leading um, indicative of whether they're going to be able to close the right number. And what we do is everyone has a, you know, for the quarter, they have their goal, sort of their lagging indicator, if you like, which is the outcome. And then for the leading, we try and ask the question, well, what activity, if done daily, would make the goal inevitable? Activity metrics. Yeah, even better. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, well, you know, if I need to get 500 leads this quarter, that means for the marketing person, that means I need to actually be spending X on our advertising and making sure we're getting a certain return, or I need to make sure that the SDRs are making a certain number of phone calls. You know, all these things that actually control what's happening rather than just sitting back and watching the, watching the ship go by. Very cool. Love that topic also. So what's the final tool you want to go over or people find most interesting? Final tool is, it's going to be more of a classic finance tool, but I think it's really important is the, is the classic sort of 13 week cash flow forecast. This is something that is always doesn't exist in, in almost all every, yeah, I'd say every single client I've ever worked with actually has not, has not had one. This was like an essential tool for running my business back in the day. Absolutely essential and essential for a few reasons, essential for owner or founder, CEO, peace of mind. Uh, you, you know, if you, if you're not confident, uh, you have your cash is in the right place, uh, for the next few months, that is a source of, um, lack of sleep and anxiety and stress that you could really do without. There could be a sort of, well, if what I don't know won't hurt me situation, I think that can sometimes happen sort of just bury the head in the sand and la la la, hope it's all going to be okay. But you know, rarely that, that doesn't really work. Uh, it's better to know. And if you've got a problem, better to sort it out two months in advance rather than the day the VAT bill arrives, which is, which is often the trigger in, in, in my experience. So, so I think that's, um, that's really, really important. The other thing is about making the right investments. And that's, that's not easy because it, it can go both ways. I've, you get really cautious owners. Uh, and you get spendthrift owners, right? And there's, 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 there's both. Uh, spendthrift, they'll obviously have the cash flow problems, but cautious ones, you know, if you know that your meta ads are working well, or your Google ads are working well, 
but you are you are underspending because you're you don't really know what your cash position is going to be like then then you are holding your business back and if you know you've got a good return on that ad spend or that market spend or whatever it is you should be investing more in it if your cash position allows but unless you know that you can't make the right decision so it's not just a sort of negative thing. it's 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 positive and negative it's about it's as much about accelerating growth as it is about not going not going bust so if i were to ask let's say if you can think of a client where you've had the biggest impact and i was to ask the owner of that business what was life like before michael came along and what and what is it like for them personally now that you're working with them what do you think they would say so i i think i know what business it is um yeah it's it's business i worked for for a number of years i'm not saying this um to to blow my own trumpet here um but they classic, you know, startup did well, good concept, pretty good product market flip fit, but they didn't, they didn't make a profit for the first five or six years. And I turned up, the owner was a bit confused. He's like, I know we're making money, but the team just asked me to put more cash in and uh, he could afford to do so. So, so it happened. What sector was it in? Can you tell us a bit more about what it was, what it was? Yeah, it's a, it's a children's sort of daycare, the, the accounts are a mess. To be honest, I still am a bit surprised by, you know, how many books of, of companies are, are, are pretty messy, even when they, they reach the sort of multi-million kind of revenue point, it, it's pretty common. Um, so that wasn't too surprising. And I think just a, a general sense of not really knowing what was going on week by week, how to price, um, you know, how, how they made money, what was going to, you know, how they're going to do in the next month or two is quite difficult. So business doing is doing really well now. I'm very proud of of, of how they've done really good young team, really dynamic, really energetic. And I think they just needed a little bit of structure because no one in the business had ever really run a business before. It's a passion project. You know, a, a young team runs it now who just started off being the first kind of few instructors. So lots of youthful energy and they're great and they work super hard and they're, they're actually great at all the different jobs now, but just didn't, didn't have the experience, uh, nothing to do with them. So. Just like creating the right plans, creating the right structures in the business, all the things I've talked about, a good scorecard, a good, a good battle rhythm, creating a plan, working to the plan, uh, and uh, you know, figuring out just how that business should work. Yeah, they, they made the first profit last year, which is really, really good. Yeah, business is really growing. Uh, taking on a couple more staff. Yeah, it's kind of got the momentum it needs now to, to, to go forward. So direction and structure, which, it, sort of leads to confidence in making the right decisions. Oh, I can see you're very proud of that impact. Yeah, I am. To be honest, that's why I absolutely love what I'm doing. I really do. I, it took me a few years to realize I, I love working with CEOs and business owners because I, I find them, I think they're incredible. I really admire them. They're so It's very brave and creative to, to start your own business or your own concept. And I really, really get a huge thrill out of helping them succeed. I think I'm much more that person than I am entrepreneurial myself. That took, took a few years to kind of realize, but that is, I feel that's my role. And that's what I want to do is to help, particularly kind of younger, but you know, all ages, but yeah, you, know, you know, younger or less experienced business owners make a success because, you know, business is failing is tragic. It's more than just a business. It's a, it's a baby, it's personal. And it, it really means so much to people. So. Yeah, I absolutely love helping businesses succeed. I normally ask people one or two questions. I've been trying a couple of different questions to wrap up, but I think I'm going to ask you the one. Have you got either a business hero that you admire most, living or dead from history or present, or a business model that you've seen that you just think is an amazing business model that you would you think is, is the best, if you like? I'm going to go with model, and but I'm not going to give an individual company, there's a few companies that fit this bill, but this is something I've really, I've really tried and bring into a few businesses, particularly B2C businesses I know. And that is, it's any business model where you get your customers to fund your marketing. So let me just say that again. So where you get, where you get your customers to, to pay for your marketing and you do this because of essentially the payment terms of Google and Meta, i.e. you can pay at the end of the month, normally at least a few weeks after when you run ads. And if you can, 
create a sophisticated, uh, it doesn't need to be, I'm not talking teams of data scientists here, a sophisticated enough model to know that you can make more from a sale than the cost of the ad, then effectively you can get the Googles and the Metas of the world to lend you money to get money from your customers to then pay pay for the ads. And at the same time, you then got a self-generating fly, marketing flywheel of a business. A great example uh, is Gymshark, who did this. Uh, I think it's a kind of under underappreciated aspect of this business, but it's actually the key bit is um, as well as having they have a great young CEO, the product's amazing, very well known for their marketing campaigns, which are definitely undeniably brilliant, like great on TikTok and all the rest of it. But they also brought in a very, very smart CFO, whose name slightly escapes me, who realized that the key to this business was generating cash very quickly. And it wasn't so much which ads generated the most visits or brand awareness or whatever it was, it was actually what kind of ad would drive an instant sale and then how quickly that payment could be funneled back into marketing to create the same same again, which is why they managed to grow incredibly quickly in, in just a few years without taking on a single penny of debt or um, equity investment. So that's something I, I, I think is fascinating. It sounds so simple, but is but is not always, and is something, I uh, yeah, I, I try and work on with my businesses. So I, I tend to do a lot with marketing. So marketing is obviously so key, but getting your marketing and spend right, and getting the cash flow cycle right within that, is um, yeah, is something super important. Great spreadsheet based answer there, which we should expect. I like it. That's good. <laughs> yes, um, <yeah. laughs> if people want to reach out to you, I know you're big on Twitter, as they say, but how else can people find you uh, to connect you if they'd like to find out more or work with you? Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, find me at, uh, at Virtual CFO on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Michael Harley, or um, Breakthrough, either way, or you can send me an email at michael at breakthrough.co. Well, thanks very much for listening. If you've got this far, congratulations. I have an ask for you. Recently, I heard a founder and CFO or CEO of uh, Broad Tree Partners give a very interesting interview. His name is David Slenzak. Let me get the pronunciation right. And he was explaining how, as a private equity firm, one of the first things they do is try and upgrade the finance function. And they see it as a unique way to add value to their partner companies and their acquisition targets as a way of getting some easy wins. So if you're listening to this and you can get me an intro to David, I would really appreciate that. So until the next one, all the best. <laughs>